everybody. Let's talk about that time constant for the RL circuit we just covered. So the current for this circuit through the inductor would look something like this, e to the minus g over tau for time constant tau in this example r over l. So this is the time constant. And if we graph the current as a function of time, before we open the switch, the current through the inductor is constant. It's all of this. It's hogging all of it. These resistors don't get anything. So it's just constant. Then when we open the switch, it's exponential decay like this. Okay, so now if we take a look at it, the current here is constant. The current later on, let's say over here, is also constant if we wait a long time. The current in between here, it's changing. So we call this some kind of transient response where it's changing. So over here is some transient response. And then if we wait long enough, we have some kind of steady state response. The question is, how long do we have to wait for it to be steady state, where it's constant? And the answer is we just wait long enough. It's a little subjective, right? So we can agree as engineers, how about if the output here, the current, is less than 1% of the original value. That's pretty small. So if we wait long enough that it's less than 1%, that seems reasonable. And that really just depends on your particular application. As an engineering team, you can say, no, that's not good enough. We need to wait until it's below 0.1%. Then you can just adjust. But for the general consensus that less than 1%, how long is that? Let's take a look at this table over here. So for time, right, so we want this over here, e to the minus t over tau, to be less than 1%. So if you wait one time constant, e to the minus t over tau, if t is one time constant, means e to the minus 1. Punch that in the calculator, e to the minus 1, you get this. I'm going to write it as a percent. 36.67, oh, 36.78, so 8. Okay, so if you wait one time constant, meaning over here, for example, like say the resistor is uh, 10 ohms and the inductor is uh, 100 henrys. Right, then the time constant would be 0.1 seconds, so like 100 milliseconds. So you wait 0.1 seconds, we're now down to 37% of the original value if we waited one time constant. What if you wait two time constants? Then that's e to the minus 2. Punch that in the calculator, it is 13.5%. Right, so now we're down to 13.5%. What if you wait three time constants. e to the minus 3, punch in the calculator, is 4.98%. Right, you wait three time, time constants, you're already down to only 5%. If you wait four time constants, punch in the calculator, 1.83%. Wait five time constants, e to the minus 5, punch in the calculator, is 0.67%. So already, if you wait five time constants, your signal is already less than 1% of the original. So this is the general consensus. If you wait five time constants, that gets you under 1%. And that would be considered long enough to wait, like a long time. But then let's say you wanted to wait just a little bit more. Six time constants, that would be point to 5%. If you wait seven time constants, that would be 
percent so now we're below 0.1 percent so that extra two time constants gets you another order of magnitude smaller because the decay is exponential okay so uh, that's all for this video i'll tell you can stop here but i have a little story that when is this applicable when i was a senior in college i was an engineering technician for a high energy physics group and one experiment we were working on was a calibration monitor for a neutrino detector so in japan they have this gigantic cave and then along the walls are photomultiplier tubes and then we, this is filled with water and there's the earth so actually it's a cave underground let's say like this so neutrinos would come through the earth like here's earth here's the neutrino detector neutrinos from the sun would come let's see through the earth and pass through this detector or there would be a super collider here and it would fire neutrinos through the detector like this but if you have a neutrino traveling through air it's hard to detect but if a neutrino is here passing through the water it kind of leaves a wake of radiation called Cherenkov radiation and that's typically around kind of the 400 nanometer range so we needed photomultipliers that could read measure 400 nanometer wavelength light so that we can pick up the Cherenkov radiation from this neutrino but we needed to know the properties of this water it'll be really like purified deionized distilled water so we needed a monitoring system to know the properties of the water so that's what we were doing at UH uh, so one project was we had a laser that would fire 400 nanometer pulses and it would fire it through a one-way mirror connected to a tube of that distilled deionized water going through a mirror to another mirror over here to another tube over here so that we had a lot of water and then this mirror would let a little bit of light through that would go to a photomultiplier tube which is just a light detector and that was connected to a computer with the A to D converter so we can get the signal to the computer so basically the light would kind of go this way bounce off the mirror bounce off this mirror bounce off this mirror and then just go back and forth through the tube of the tubes of water like this back and forth and every time it'll bounce a little bit of it would get through here into the photomultiplier tube and then we read the signal so then it looks kind of like hey, you get a pulse and then it go and come back then we get another pulse go and come back get another pulse and then because light when it's traveling through water some of it gets absorbed some of it gets scattered so i was Part of my job was tune the laser to make sure it's the right wavelength and that it's collimated and that it's going through the middle of the tube and adjust this mirror and adjust this mirror to make sure it goes in the middle of this tube and then i wrote the software to do this capture the data capture and then the data analysis if you pick up the peaks here and here and then you do a, an exponential fit because ultimately the physicists wanted the time constant so I do an exponential fit, right? And then it's e to the minus t over tau, and they wanted that number. So that was a practical application. And then we were gonna install this in the photo detector in Japan, but that trip coincided with my first semester in grad school. So I had to wait, like, do I wanna skip three weeks of my first semester in grad school to go on this trip? So at the time I didn't, I just went to school, but if, let's say you as a student were asking me now i would say is it worth maybe prolonging your graduation by semester to do this trip absolutely yes because you know when you go on the trip you gain valuable experience you make professional connections that 
kind of weighs heavily on your resume. Okay, so I don't want to rattle on too long. If you have any questions about time constant, or just want to talk story about any of this stuff, just let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video.